Good morning. So glad you're all here. So glad that you get to join us in the experience of God's love. We get to bask in his presence, discover who he is uh, more and more, deeper, together as we grow in relationship with one another. So we're so glad that you're here. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience as God does move and he has been moving. And we are thrilled because this is a group effort, right? This is a body effort. That's what the Bible refers to the church as, Christ's body, the body of Christ. Each one of us is a member. We are a member of the greater body. And so we're excited to see what God is doing here locally in the Danvers and North Shore area, um, but also we're excited to see what God is going to do internationally and is doing internationally through this local body. A whole lot more about that coming this year, for sure. This we're calling the year of vision. Our goal is to really focus the vision and clarify what is it specifically that God is asking us to do. And so we have lots of irons in the fire. We have teams of people who are getting together and are meeting everything from reassessing what partnership is all about, our, our word for membership. What does it mean to be a member of this local body, or as again, as we call it, a partner of this local body, being very specific about what that looks like and what's entailed in that. What do we get to do as far as we being those who are partners of this church? What does that mean to link arms together? To, to spread the gospel, to help other people to know God, to grow together, and to go to serve. And so um, I'm very excited. We are, as a team, extremely excited about where God is leading us. So uh, be praying for us as we, uh, as we transition many of the approaches that we have to everything from leadership to, uh, like I mentioned already, you know, partnership. And where are we headed? What does that mean specifically? So be praying for uh, the church leadership, but also be praying to say, God, here am I, send me. God, help me to know where I can serve to be part of furthering your kingdom in this local area. Okay, so we're excited and uh, we're glad that you're, that you're part of it. One of the things that excites us, one of the things that excites us is the fact that we are transformed in our relationship with Jesus. We've spent the last several weeks, and we have the next few, that we're going to continue to talk about this. We are transformed into brand new people when we surrender control of our lives to Jesus, and when a growing personal relationship with Him continues on, okay? It brings renewal to every part of our lives. We've touched on several already. Our minds are renewed, right? Our minds are renewed by Jesus, okay? And here's the passage of Scripture that we've been focusing on, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has, is here, right? So the new is in our minds, as I just mentioned, right? We have a renewed mind, okay? The Holy Spirit changes the way that we think, right? We let go of the old ways of thinking, he also renews our identity. The world will have us believe this and that about who we really are, but it's defined. Our true identity is defined by God himself. We are a loved child of God, as we heard earlier, right? We are a loved child of God, okay? It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. They don't define who we are, nor do we. Who we are, our identity has already been defined, and it's been defined as a child of God by God himself. We talked about renewed priorities, okay? Renewed priorities, okay? When Jesus is on the throne, when God is on the throne and in charge of our lives, then we trust him, and we can take him at his word. Our worries and our anxiety fade away, because as we mentioned, worry and anxiety is our attempt to take control of our lives back from God. It's not our job to figure out the outcome. It's our job to play our role and to trust him, right? And as a result and as a response, our faith grows stronger as well, okay? God is able to demonstrate his faithfulness as we take him at his word. Elisha talked about renewed relationships. The following week, uh, Larry shared with us about purpose. Last week, we started talking about uh, intimacy, and we looked at the fact that our culture settles for a very incomplete understanding of what intimacy really is, right? What true intimacy really is. We are physical beings, yes, but we're a whole lot more than that, aren't we? How many of you know that? 
Good. <laughs> okay, because we're also emotional beings. We're very social beings, right? Some of us more than others, perhaps. But we're mental beings. Not, again, not mentally deranged, but, you know, that's an aspect of who we are. And yes, spiritual. We are spiritual beings as well, created by God to be that way. And here's God's plan, as we started last week talking about. God's plan for true intimacy is for all five of these aspects of who we are as, 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 as human beings to work together in harmony. That's true intimacy as God would have it, Okay. And yet we were made to enjoy intimacy with God first. And it's through that relationship that powers our other relationships. Okay? God always comes first. And then he's, he, his, our relationship with him and the intimacy that he provides then fuels the intimacy that we can have with other people. Now, I will come right off, right off the top here. And I'm going to say, I did leave you hanging last week. How many of you knew that? How many of you noticed that? Like kind of a cliffhanger ending? Yeah? Yeah, okay, you knew that because I told you I did. But anyway, um, yeah, so last week we kind of ended it, you know, with, with a statement that we are invited to intimacy, right? You know, we are invited to him to, to intimacy, and that invitation comes from Jesus. So uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. We're going to start today by picking up right where we left off. So go ahead and grab your Bibles. It's going to be John chapter 15, verses 9 through 17, John 15, beginning at verse 9. Uh, if you don't know where that is, somebody stole my Bible. Whoever it is will be punished. But I have a Bible right here so I can hold it up. Anyone have an extra Bible? Right up here, front row. Extra Bible, anybody? Thank you very much. John is one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. There are four Gospels. The first four books of the New Testament are known as the Gospels. Um, if you didn't bring your Bible with you, it's okay, all right? We don't shame anybody. That's not a reason to shame anybody anyway, but uh, we have Bibles here. So it's in the racks directly underneath the seat in front of you. If you'd grab one, if you didn't bring one, that's fine. Um, go ahead and uh, flip to the book of John in these Bibles. Um, it's page 1069. But the first four books of the New Testament are known as the Gospels, and John is the fourth out of the four written by, you guessed it, John. John chapter 15. We're going to look at verse 9. And here is the point. This is the first point, and that is that we have an intimate invitation. Intimate invitation. Okay, here's verse 9. As the Father has loved me, guess who's speaking? Anybody? Very good. This is Jesus speaking. He's talking to his disciples, his followers. He says, as the Father has loved me so have I loved you? Now, he says, now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. Verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Verse 16, you did not choose me. I chose you. Now, isn't that cool? Because remember, he's talking to his disciples. And we all know, many of us probably know the story of the calling of the disciples where Jesus went and called them. And he said, come, you, you, follow me. So he's being literal here. But think of it as, as a statement that he's making for generations, for all time, to future disciples. You did not choose me. Did you know that? You didn't choose Jesus. You didn't, you didn't accept Jesus. You received him. He reached out to you, right? He pointed to you. He appointed you. He called you. Okay, he says, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Fancy way of saying evidence, right? If you've been changed by Jesus, then there's evidence. It becomes obvious to everybody around you. Okay, we don't do good works so that we get approved. 
we do good works as an extension of what God has done and is doing in our hearts. And that's known as fruit, a Christianese word that many of us have used before, but I wanted to define that. And then the last part of verse 16, it says, Jesus says, then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. If there's a passage in Scripture that talks so clearly about intimacy, true intimacy, more clearly than this passage, I don't know where it would be. Powerful, powerful truth. Now, as you came in, everybody should have received an invitation, right? Go ahead and grab it. Everybody should have received an invitation. If you don't have one, put your hand up. If you don't have one, okay, do we have any left? Are we uh, all out of them or are there extras? What? They're all out. Okay, all right. So, yay, great. Okay, awesome, awesome. We'll get you one if you don't see us afterwards. Uh, But it says here, you are cordially invited to... And if you flip it open, intimacy. Here's the invitation we talked about last week. You and I are invited to intimacy. And if you notice too, it says RSVP required on the front, right? You do have to respond at some point, okay? We're going to get to this in just a moment, but I wanted to make sure everybody received it. This is, this is an, an invitation from Jesus. He is inviting you and me to experience true intimacy with himself. True intimacy, as we've been talking about, with God the Father first and foremost. Okay, look at verses 9 and 10 again. It says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. So have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I no longer call you servants, it says in verse 15, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, again, what did we just read? Instead, I have called you what? Friends. Friends. For everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. You are cordially invited to intimacy with God the Father. Now, here's something that's really cool. The word remain, you notice how he uses that word several times in the first couple verses? Remain in my love. You will remain in my love. He says remain in his love. He's talking about his relationship with his Father. He goes on and talks about this. The Greek word that we translated in English for remain is meno, meno. It's actually very impressive, but it's a very easy pronunciation. So (laughs) meno, it's a Greek word, okay? And the word, listen to this, the word we use remain, okay, in the Greek, the original language, recording what Jesus said, the word actually means to stay. It means to stay as in to stay in a given place, to state, to be in a state, just to stay right there, right? Uh, it's to stay in, in relation, okay? Or expectancy, to be expectant, to stop, to wait, to stay where you are expectantly. Is that cool? The word picture for that? It's powerful. He says, remain in my love, okay? Another, a few words that also are, this word is, in Greek is used for, uh, it, it's used to, to say dwell, It means dwell. It means to be present. Now, how many of you have conversations with a significant other, and it's a challenge sometimes to be present with each other? No cell phones, excuse me, no smart, I mean, um, no, right? Yeah, sometimes just being present with one another means there are no distractions, right? To remain with someone, to be present, to tarry for, as if you're, you're waiting for something, you're anticipating something to come. So why does he want us to remain in his love? Why does Jesus want us to remain in his love? He's inviting us to intimacy. He wants to experience true intimacy with you, and he wants you to experience it with him as well. Look at verse 11. I have told you this so that what? So that my what? My joy, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you. The reason why Jesus wants us to tarry for him, to wait on him, to remain in his love is so that his joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. He wants us to experience true joy. That's fleeting for most of us. How do you experience true joy? How do you really have joy? 
is to wait on God. It's to remain in Christ's love. It's to experience the level of intimacy that God intended you and me to experience with him and then with each other. To remain in his love. Look at what he says. To remain in his love. How do you do that? To remain in his love means what? What do you have to do in order to remain in his love? What does he say? At the very beginning, what does he say? Say it again. Obey my commands. Verse 10. If you obey my commands, you will. Not might. He says, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I obey my Father's commands. Okay, now here's that word. <sighs> obey brings about rebellion in many of us. I'm not going to obey anybody. I'm my own man. I want to do things my way, right? Yes? How many of you agree? Cheryl agrees wholeheartedly, and she's smiling. I don't know what that means, um, but uh, yeah, we don't like to be told what to do. But here he says, you, if you obey my commands, you will remain in me. Hmm. Do you remember the story last week with Adam and Eve? The story of the first two people on earth? What happened to Adam and Eve? and God, and their relationship with God, what happened? They disobeyed when God said, don't eat of this tree, right? They disobeyed, and what happened to their relationship? Anybody? It broke. Their relationship was broken because trust was broken. Remember last week? Trust is the core of intimacy. If you don't have trust in a relationship, you cannot experience true intimacy. It's impossible. And so when Adam and Eve broke God's command and disobeyed him, trust was broken and intimacy was broken. And as you saw, it also broke the intimacy with each other. Why do we put God first? Why do we seek intimacy with God first? Because it then empowers intimacy in other relationships. True, complete, total, real, authentic intimacy is only possible when God comes first in our lives. You can't have spiritual intimacy with anybody else if you don't have it with God, right? And so Jesus says right here, remain in my love. Experience the trueness of intimacy with me first by obeying me. By obeying my commands, by keeping the trust relationship with us in place, intact, by not breaking my commands. So when we remain in Christ's love, we do so by obeying his commands, and intimacy can thrive because trust is built. Okay? I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete Jesus wants his joy to thrive within us. That's what his desire is. He wants us to experience complete joy. Wait a minute, that doesn't sound like an angry, mean God. Jesus took care of the consequences of our sin. And so what we get is the benefit of the love relationship that Jesus made possible with us. Thank you, Lord. Okay, so when we accept this invitation to intimacy from Jesus, what are we choosing? According to verse 11, what are we choosing when we accept this invitation to Jesus? By accepting this invitation to intimacy, I choose joy. Joy, right? True joy. So go ahead and get a pen. I want you to just, just write on the line. Write the word joy. Don't check the box. Just write the line. Write on the line, Okay. By accepting this invitation to intimacy, I choose joy. I'm choosing joy. That's my experience. There are pens. They should be in the pockets right in front of you, too, if you need one. So if we disobey him, trust is violated. 
right? Intimacy is broken, our relationship is strained, and what happens to our joy? Anybody? It's gone. It vanishes. It's gone. Okay? So we have an intimate invitation, all right? Put this aside, hold on to it. We'll get back to it in a minute, in a few minutes. All right. Secondly, let's look at some intimacy hacks. Let's look at some intimacy hacks. Now, what does it mean? What does hack mean? Okay, so a hack, okay, to hack is to cut with rough or heavy blows, right? You hack at something, okay? Um, that's what happens. This is what we're going to talk about, okay? This is what happens to intimacy. But hack also has another term. Uh, any computer geniuses here? Anybody? Com yeah, you get it, right? Hack, well, what does that mean, okay? Well, that means to alter or reprogram the original design of computer software. So this is, a, this is what happens. This, these are some things that, that will alter or reprogram the original design of intimacy. You following me? Either term. If you're a computer nerd, like I tend to be sometimes, or you're just like a rough and tumble, that was gross, a rough and tumble kind of guy, and you like to grab an axe and just hack away at something, all right? Or wh whatever. Either way, it, it means the same thing, okay? So there are two main areas that intimacy gets short-circuited, if you will, okay? The first area is how we relate to ourselves. Now, this may be review for some of you, and that's okay. It's important that we do that from time to time. So one of the ways that we relate to ourselves that can, that can hack intimacy in our lives is our own brokenness, okay? Right? Emotionally healthy spirituality. Remember this? The walls that we build that we need to lean into, that we need to get past, right, with God's help, Okay, our own brokenness can prevent us from experiencing intimacy. Okay, remember the lens that we talked about a few weeks ago. The way that we look at life, the lens that we look at life through, can actually wreak havoc with our ability to experience intimacy. Okay, because we assume everybody is out to get us, or we assume whatever it is, right? There's the lens. Okay, another intimacy hack in how we relate to ourselves is our fear of being hurt. Talked about that last week, our fear of perhaps hurting other people. In this sense, we tend to withdraw, right? I don't want to be hurt, and so I'm going to withdraw from other people. I'm going to pull back. I'm going to restrain my, you know, my reaching out to anyone. I'm just afraid that they're going to hurt me, or I may even hurt them, okay? There's a second type of category, if you will, of of what I'm calling intimacy hacks, and that's how we relate to others. So it's how we relate to ourselves, but also how we relate to others. Here's a killer one. Get the pun? Is that clever? All right, anyway, comparisons. Benjamin, I knew Benjamin would get it. <laughs> comparisons. The way we compare ourselves to other people, almost like, you know, there's competition here. Right? And it leads us to judgmentalism and to condemnation of others. You know, for example, you know, this person is less than me because they struggle with a sin that I don't. That's gross. Ugh. Right? Are you going to be able to have intimacy with someone that you look down at? No. Right? I'm better than that person. Or, you know, at least I don't do that. The way that we compare ourselves with others can eliminate the opportunity to experience intimacy the, gay, the, the way that God intended us to experience it. Now, there's another extreme as well. Well, you know what? That person's really good at this, but I'm not as good as they are. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know enough about the Bible, so I, I can't, God can't use me in that way. You know, they're, they're better at they're, they're more gifted than, they're nicer looking. They, they have a better personality than, you know, they give more money. They deserve that more than, than me. See how it can swing both ways? It starts over here, and then it can end over here before you know it. Folks, comparisons. As we, as we compare ourselves with other people in an unhealthy way like this, they cause us to build walls. Walls that divide us from other people. It is not God's plan for that to happen. 
God does not want us to be divided. God wants us to be united, brought together. Comparisons pull us away from one another. Comparisons isolate us. Why is it default for so many of us that when things get tough, we pull away from other people? I'm, I'm right there, okay? Why do we do that? It is one of Satan's most effective ploys. He works so hard to divide us so that he can conquer us. That is how he works. He works so hard to keep us from true, intimate relationships. Why? Because that means God has to be involved. That means that we need to be fully surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ in order to experience the kind of intimacy that God intends for you and me to experience. And that scares him to death. Because when the church rises up, when the church links arms and gathers together under one purpose, and that is to make disciples of all nations look out. And he is scared to death of that. And this is one of the main areas that he works, to keep Christians divided, keep believers away from each other. They might link arms. Oh, my goodness. And then the forces of darkness are in big trouble. Mm. It robs us, this, this spirit of, of comparison, this comparing ourselves with, with other people. It prevents intimacy. And what does that mean? It robs us of joy. You see, verse 11 again, it robs us of the joy that God intends through the intimacy. There's another intimacy hack in how we relate to others. And here it is again, being hurt or triggered, right? This is kind of the other extreme, right? This is where, you know, we cut people off. You know, we, we go on the attack, the offense, right? Let me just say this. If you haven't been hurt by someone, you're probably under a year of age, okay? Um, it's going to happen. It's not an if, it's a when. We will hurt each other. Why? Because we're horribly terrible pr people, right? Um, well, we're human, and we're dumb, and we're imperfect, and we're going to say something that comes out wrong. We're going to do something in anger. Uh, we're going to mean well, perhaps, but it doesn't work. It, you know, our motives might be pure, but it just doesn't, it falls apart. It doesn't, it, or maybe we do something to hurt someone else on purpose, So think about it. What, what is the response? I mean, thank you for telling me the obvious, Pastor Dan. People are, are going to hurt me. People have hurt me, perhaps. And so I'm just going to choose to trust no one, as the X-Files would say so proudly. Trust no one, right? Trust no, I'm not going to trust anybody. What's, no trust means no intimacy. Is that the kind of life you want to live? Do you want to live a life with no intimacy? So then what does that mean? Does that mean then that we need to become doormats and let everybody walk all over us in order to experience the possibility of intimacy? No, it doesn't mean that either. But what does it mean? It means that we need to be open to the potential and the possibility and the likelihood that we will be hurt, but we still put ourselves out there with God's help because of the possibility of what we could experience with God in number one place, in top billing, in, in, in top priority in our lives. And so then the issue becomes not whether or not I will choose to trust people, but what am I going to do when they hurt me, right? Isn't that what it comes down to? How am I going to respond?
I've shared my struggle many times, you know. I mean, this is, this is very difficult for those of us that have experienced a lot of pain in our lives, right? And those of us from a young age, perhaps, that maybe made vows that I will not allow people to hurt me again. How do you learn to allow that possibility again, right? It's impossible. But with God, all things are possible, right? Am I a proponent of being hurt? Of course not. But am I a proponent of responding in a healthy way when I get hurt? Yes, I am. Do I know how to do that perfectly? Heck no. Am I learning? Absolutely. This is the position I I submit to you that we all need to have when it comes to things like this. Am I going to respond in a healthy way with grace and with maturity even if they don't hurt me accidentally. (laughs) What does it mean to respond with grace? How many of you have received the grace that God has offered you through Jesus? Grace means I didn't work for it. I didn't deserve it. It was given to me as a gift. Undeserved favor. Who the heck are we to not extend it to one another? How dare I do that? Hmm. You know, we're working on some principles uh, that, that we want to help, where we want to help one another. Again, remember, we're on this together. We're all working through stuff. We're all growing in relationship with God those of us that are living for him, those of you that are still exploring that, you are welcome. We are so glad you're here, and we encourage you to stay open to God because he's got an incredible plan for your life, okay? But those of us that are, that are believers, it doesn't mean that we're perfect all of a sudden. You know, we pray this magic prayer, and poof, you know, we're going to heaven, yay, and everything's going to be great, and when I plant weeds, roses will grow. I mean, come on. You know, life is life, okay? Life is normal. The key now is that we have the power of the one who created the universe living inside of us to help us to figure things out, right? Isn't that cool? And so one of the things that we're trying to figure out is how do we deal with it when these kinds of things happen? How about within the church? We're going to get to that more in just a moment, but how about when it happens within the church? Oh my goodness, right? And so there's an organization that we want to link arms with, and it's, and it's, a, it's called Peacemaker. And they have some terrific resources, and we're actually trying to build this into our partnership um, you know, course as well. Um, but, but how do you maintain peace? And how do you define it? Sometimes people define peace as, oh, it's the absence of conflict. That's not true. Okay, some people, you know, define peace as, oh, okay, so that means that I'm a, you know, that, that I become a doormat, and I just, you know, just to keep the peace, I'm just not going to ruffle feathers. No, it doesn't mean that at, at, at all, right? So what does that mean? How do we keep peace? How do we biblically, in a Christ-like way, how do we address conflict with one another? And so we're, we're working on that kind, of, that kind of information as well. It's very, very important. How do we respond when we are hurt? Again, are we going to settle for a healthy way of responding? Are we going to respond in a way that is gracious and mature? Or are we just going to settle for low-risk, superficial relationships, throw away any opportunity for intimacy? That's our choice. Here's the third point and the final point this morning. Intimate diversity. Diversity. Intimate diversity, as I mentioned, I want to look at this in the context of of the body of Christ, okay? How are we, as this local body of believers, how are we living out this principle of intimacy? Is it even possible to, to get and to maintain intimacy with so much diversity? Is it possible? Yes, it is, because again, with God, all things are possible, right? Turn to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to look at two verses briefly. Galatians 3, 27 and 28. Galatians is further in the the Bible, way at the back, page 1153 if you're still looking for it. 
Galatians 3, 27 and 28. Paul is talking, he says, for all of you, he's talking to the church in Galatia, okay? A.K.A. the Galatians, okay? He says, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Look at this, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, and the list could go on, for you are all, what? Oh, wait a minute, now hold on. He's going to be talking to one full group of people that are listening all at the same time, right? Because he can't be talking about everybody collectively as one, right? Is he? Yes, he is. You are all one in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, we are united. We are one. Now let's flip back to John 15. John 15, verses uh, 12 through 14 again. Remember, he says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay his life down for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. And then verse 17, he says, this is my command, love each other. Intimate diversity. Again, nothing is impossible for God. We can have unity within diversity. We can have unity without uniformity as well. We don't all have to look the same, be the same. We can have unity within all of our differences, okay? That's God's plan, and God is doing this within our church body. He is doing this within us and among us right here and right now. DCN is diverse, okay? We are, as far as race goes, we are six times more diverse than Danvers proper, according to the census, okay? Praise God for that, okay? We are diverse in cultures. We are diverse in genders, in ages, in in church background experiences. We're different, very different in socioeconomic comparisons. And yet we can still maintain unity anyway. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit that unifies us. We are unified for the purpose that God has called us to be unified for, to spread the gospel, to share the love of Jesus. Folks, you know what's really cool? This is really close to my heart, especially this part. We can maintain unity as a body of believers, even with differing opinions on gray areas. Politics. Did you know that Jesus is not a Republican? Some of you I need to say that to. I'm just saying, right? Okay? Just saying. Okay? We can have differing opinions. Now, these, these are gray areas, okay? On non-essential areas of church doctrine, okay? In theology. Do you drink alcohol? No, I don't. And if you do, you go to hell. It does not belong here. First of all, that's unbiblical. And secondly, you need to pursue God first and foremost. And you need to be open to what God tells you and reveals to you about these issues, these social button, hot button issues of today, right? There are basic black and white issues, and we stand on truth. Scripture is very clear about some of the issues that people actually are arguing about today. We will not shy away from truth. We won't. But here's what else we won't do. We will not draw a line in the sand and say, you know, if you are not, you know, believing like this about this gray area, then you're not a good enough Christian, or you're not welcome enough to be part of this church. We will not do that. And, and I'm wondering what will happen the day when someone does walk in this door that looks and acts and believes differently than you and I do. Are we going to love them knowing that God's job is to convict the heart, not our job. What happens when the doors open and a transvestite walks in? How are we going to respond? Are we going to be uncomfortable and switch seats? Or are we going to share the love of Christ with them, knowing that they are a soul that Jesus loves too? We can believe the truth Or we could be people who are people without integrity. 
The truth is that God changes the heart. And we're talking about identity here, right? Our identity is not based on sexual preference. That, is not de- that does not define who we are. Okay? Because we're not just physical. We're emotional. We're spiritual. We're mental. So love and compassion requires us to love the person, period. And trust that God will change their heart just like he changes our heart when we are open to his influence. My spiritual pride is no less or more sinful than sex outside of a heterosexual marriage relationship, which the Bible defines, right? My sin may have different consequences than other sins, but in God's eyes, all sin is falling short of his glory. So who are we? How dare we? How dare we single out one sin over another sin just because we don't struggle with it? It's incompatible with our faith. It's hypocrisy when it boils down to it. How do we have intimate diversity? By putting God first in our fellowship, in our relationships with one another. Remember the triangle illustration? God, we've got God's child, we've got God's child. We can work on trying to get along with each other, or what can we do? We can seek God, and what happens? We grow closer to each other and to God as we seek God. That's the plan. That's God's plan for true intimacy, folks. That's what it's about. This is only possible if we remain in Christ. This is only possible when we remain in him and we wait expectantly for him to move among us. His joy grows within us. His, you know, our relationship with him, it makes our joy complete. Remember, folks, remember what happened with the disciples. The disciples received the power of God, the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. It was God, the Holy Spirit, who provided the power that grew that church, that brought the unity of the church together, that made the church what it became, to made the church to be able to fulfill the call that Jesus gave it. And it's the same for us today. It is only the Holy Spirit that is going to make any of this possible. Only He can make it possible. We need to yield to Him. We need to surrender our lives to him and put him in first place. I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit is waiting to empower this church. He is waiting to empower you and to empower me if we will take him at his word, if we will be serious in putting him in first place, not just an hour and a half on a Sunday morning every week. He wants all of us, 100%, And as we remain in Jesus, we're going to be granted access to a level of intimacy with him and with one another that we have never experienced before, that we have never thought possible before. How is it going to happen? As we get ready to close, how is it going to happen? Let's look back at verse 9 and 10. Remain. Remain in me. Remain in my love. A great way to remain in God's love is by praying together praying together, sharing burdens with one another and struggles that we're dealing with that we need God to intervene with and and, and work through, that brings intimacy, not just with him, but with each other. We get to celebrate answers to prayer as they happen. As God moves powerfully among us, and he does, there are healings that have been reported, including myself. As we gather together, Healing takes place. We celebrate. It bonds us. It bonds our hearts together. Folks, that's why this march of prayer is is not just a, a cutesy little timing thing. Okay? We believe in prayer. And I invite you as your pastor, I implore you, please make praying together a priority. Let's start for the 31 days of March. And let's see what God does. Remember putting God first? Remember the analogy? You know, my brother, you know, oh my goodness, I'm overwhelmed with work and homework at college. And he was counseled wisely. 
to put God first and God would expand your mind and make it possible and my brother put God first and then somehow his brain was able to absorb the information and he was able to do well in school. Put God first, put him to the test, I dare you to. Will you need to rearrange your schedule? Yes, based on what priorities you have, of course. Someday I will make it an absolute priority to work out every day. Someday, Aaron, someday. Aaron's, can I embarrass you? Aaron's, yes, can I? Are you all right? Great. Right. Aaron's lost 16 pounds in a month, okay? So the kid's on fire, okay? And I'm smoldering like a pile of crap in the back. Anyway, okay, so what we prioritize, we make time for, okay? Praying together, please, I implore you, put it in the top priority of your life because it's seeking God. It's intimacy with God, okay? God will bring us together as we do that. Another way that we can remain in God's love is by serving together. Folks, some of the strongest relationships within our church have formed while serving together side by side over the years, especially these, these big events that we have, have done in the past that, that, you know, as God raises up teams, we want to do again, Okay? We still have relationships that are close because of that. Remain in God's love. Folks, God has renewed our understanding and our depth of intimacy as our relationship with Him go, grows, continues to grow. And by putting God in first place in our lives and in our relationships, we get to know Him and His love intimately. And again, that love then empowers us to love others more genuinely, bringing us together in true intimacy. That's what this is about. That's what he wants for us. We're free at that point to bask in the joy of being God's much-loved child. Are you ready to respond to your invitation of intimacy from Jesus? If you are, I want to encourage you to check the box. This is for you. It's a visual reminder to take home, okay? If you are willing to accept the invitation to intimacy with him. Check the box, and then I want you to bring it home and put it somewhere where you don't forget. And the John 15, 11 passage is there as a reminder of what this is all about. You are precious and you are loved. I want to remind everybody quickly that the meeting, uh, for anyone who's interested um, at looking uh, at, at making this event happen, you know, ensuring that it takes place. We need more people. If we don't get enough people, then this is probably not the year that we bring it back, and that's okay. We'll try again next year. Um, but that meeting will be held right after this, this, uh, the message here today. I'm going to ask Benjamin, just Benjamin, to come on up, and uh, I'm going to ask him just to, to play uh, the acoustic guitar. We're going we're gonna to just play... The, the song, again, No Longer Slaves, just as a reminder as we're on our way out in just a few moments, that our Father loves us. Amen. Jesus loves us so very much, and let's remember that we don't have to be enslaved anymore. We don't have to, to be enslaved anymore to, to fear because we are His children. Let's stand together. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for what you've made possible for all of us as, as children of our mighty creator, God. What an awe, a feeling of awe that we have. What an awesome truth that that is. God, I want to pray for each and every one of us that we would experience the intimacy that you are inviting us to we would embrace you, God, in trust. And that we could be used by you, God, to do what is impossible any other way. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.